My name is Lawrence Joseph Powell. I was born May 17, 1923. I'm a retired colonel in the Air Force, and I'm also a retired director in the movie industry. I survived three near-fatal plane crashes. I had third-degree burns on 60% of my body. Before we get started, I want to tell you something. My life, I have lived under a white cloud. I'm not Mr. Boflivitz that lived under a black cloud. My life has been one series of right moves, right circumstances all its life. And my philosophy of life is, no matter today's disadvantage, may be tomorrow's advantage. All you have to do is wait long enough to find out. It may take a while. And it works every time. We had the radio on, and we were listening to Peter Potter's Platter Parade on KMPC. And they broke in and said, We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. And I nudged my buddy, and I said, The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. And he said, Where the hell's Pearl Harbor? I said, I don't know, but the Japanese have attacked it. Anyway, we found out that it was in Honolulu, and we got in our car, and the streets were absolutely deserted throughout L.A. There was just nobody stirring. Everybody was glued to their radios. I said, I'm a mechanic. What they can do is I'm going to wait to get drafted. So sure enough, January 21st, 1943, I was drafted. a dream. It was fast to go anywhere. It was a very forgiving airplane until you got your experience. We could go as high as anybody could go, and we could go farther than anybody could go. Bomber escort, that was our primary mission. The P-51 was designed to escort long ranges. And we put the tanks on, and our missions were seven, eight, and nine hours long. Well, the bombers would go in and bomb the target, and then we had so much fuel, we'd, we'd go back in and pick up targets of opportunity. Straight airfields, uh, trains, Anything that we, anything moved, we, we shot up. When I was a kid, I lived on Winchester Street in West Glendale, and there were in the neighborhood kids, and there were seven of us plus a girl, and it was just about the time Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out for Disney. And so naturally, being that there were seven of us kids, boys, we all picked one of the dwarves. And for some reason, I picked Happy. And, and you must be... Happy, ma'am. That's me. And this is Dopey. And it just stuck with me. And uh, when I got overseas, they asked me, well, what do I want to put on my airplane when I get one? And uh, I really couldn't think of anything that went with Patricia my wife, that I wanted to put on the airplane. So I said, why not just name it Happy? And on the old B-5, 
which was the oldest airplane in the group, it became happy. And I flew all my combat in that airplane with only four machine guns. I destroyed all my airplanes and all the trains and trucks with four guns. And got to the point where uh, my crew called me happy. In fact, most of the people called me happy. And it, was, it, it, it sort of stuck. I've always been sort of a happy type. To me, the glass was always half full, not half empty. So I guess that's the way I became happy. I'm classified as a 8th Air Force ace. Before the invasion of, of June 6th, Normandy, we destroyed so many German airplanes in the air that they refused to come up. And so Doolittle, who was our commanding officer, 8th Air Force, he said, well, if they won't come up, tell you what, if you go down and get them on the deck, I'll give you the same credit as you would if you had shot them down in the air. So many, I think there was 385 8th Air Force aces that shot down a combination of some in the air and, and some on the ground, or maybe all on the ground. Who knows? A true ace, you have to destroy five in the air in mortal combat. So, quote, quote. My, I'm two and a half in the air and three and a half in the ground. And uh, one probably destroyed, 11 damage. So I am an 8th Air Force ace. I was on Market Garden all seven days. You, you probably remember it as a bridge too far. But I remember paratroops and uh, gliders and burning C-47s. Oh, it was, it was just a, very disheartening. Because there wasn't anything we could do the fighters, we were just given top cover. On the fifth day, we were attacked by 35 uh, FW-190s, of which we destroyed, uh, I think, eight of them. I destroyed one. I hit him as he, as he rolled over, and I chased him down, and I saw 600 miles an hour on the dial. And that's pretty damn fast in a Mustang. I started pulling out at 5,000 feet, and I leveled off at 500 feet, and he didn't level off. That was my last aerial victory. I made 68 mission takeoffs but only 67 landings. Actually, I was on my second tour. I finished my first tour of 65 missions. I was an unusual person when I went overseas because I was married and I was a father when I went overseas. There weren't too many of those. I say I was shot down because it makes me look not quite so stupid. But I was strafing a train and a, a locomotive, and I was sitting under high tension wires that I didn't see until too late. And I ran right into the wires, and I really screwed my airplane up. And I lasted 45 minutes until I ran into a big aerial battle going on overhead. and. Uh, I dove away from it, and just as I dove away in a turn, the engine overheated and the coolant popped and covered my canopy with coolant. I was the flight commander, so I had four other pilots with me. By the time I had leveled out to bail out, I let the canopy go. The treetops were whistling by. I said to myself, well, Paul, this is the second time you f***ed up today. I was going to have to put it into the trees. And just as it 
hit 120 miles an hour. A nice long field opened up right in front of me. And I just dumped full flaps, set it on its belly. And being in January of 1945, it was very, very cold. The ground was frozen, slid right up between two German houses. I got out of the airplane, and there was a farmer came at me with a pitchfork. I took my uh, parachute off, threw it in his direction, he turned around, ran that way. I turned around and ran toward the woods. And as I was running toward the woods between these two houses, I passed two little girls, probably five or six, and they were crying. As I get scared because the P-51 was sliding right up toward them. And I patted them on the heads and told them not to cry. Everything was fine, and then I ran off into the woods. Thirty minutes later, after the camp was liberated, General Patton was there in his Jeep. And I leaned on his Jeep, and his driver was a staff sergeant, gave me a box of K-rations from his Jeep. And I often thought I should have kept them, but I ate them. And General Patton was from, like, from here to you. He said he stood up on the steps of the little little house that was in there, in the camp, and said, gentlemen, this is the worst conditions I have ever seen an American officer subjected to. I remember those words. Yeah, he had this high squeaky voice, but it was sure nice to see him. And then he got in the Jeep and rode off into, into the sunset. Turned out to be a permanent party, Air National Guard at Van Nuys, air technician. I was the maintenance officer of a P-51 fighter squadron. Great duty right here at Van Nuys Airport. I have lunch over at 94 Squadron. I look across over to the ramp, and I just imagine a nice long line of 25 P-51s sitting there. Those are good memories. Those are beautiful days. After I also had my second airplane accident. March 28th, 1948, about four o'clock in the afternoon. We were still, still making these World War II landings, nose to tail, nose to tail, like that cotton prop wire. Now, I'm probably one of the most experienced fighter pilots that they got on the base, the B-51. And then let this thing get in to the shape it was, it, uh, inexcusable. Hit the ground, left wing, snapped the left gear. The nose came down, the prop came off. The engine digs into the dirt because there had been a lot of rain. But the momentum twists the airplane off the mounts and is now back in the air, upside down, backwards. And when it twists out, I said, wow, that's a hell of an accident, but I'm alive. I could hear the tower, the siren blowing from the tower. And then all of a sudden, crack. Then the first thing I do, I'm smelling for smoke. Didn't that smell? Gas and oil, but no smoke, because if it had been fire, I would not have been cinders, because the fuselage was right smack upside down. My head was about that far from the dirt. It took 40 guys to lift the airplane off the top of me. I, I have to say, I was a pretty good-looking guy back in those days. 
and I was a fighter pilot, and there was no ego in my family because I had it all. And I knew it. I was one of the best pilots in the world. I made it around the world in 10 days once. I was flying all over the world. Now, I'm a squadron commander. I got 400 men, 40 airplanes. Yeah, I'm, I'm the top rung. And I get a call from a fellow by the name of Maury Abrams. I, he said, Larry Powell? I said, yeah. You still want to be an, a, a, an assistant director? I said, who is this? He said, this is Maury Abrams of the Director's Guild. He said, I have an application here. It says, you want to be an assistant director? I said, I, I never signed any application. I said, who is that? Well, it's signed by your dad. He says, it's five years old, but we need some assistant directors. He said, I have to know by tomorrow morning. I said, Mr. Abrams, you want me to make up my mind to change my whole life's career overnight? He said, well, I got to know so that you can meet the council on Saturday. My stepfather, Wilbur McGaw, uh, he became a director. He was on All Quiet in the Western Front as a second assistant director. He became a, uh, an assistant director for Fox. Fox. He, he, was, he worked for everybody. So I called my dad, my stepdad, and I asked him, I said, what the hell is this? He said, listen, you asshole, what are you going to do when you're 55? That stopped me because it never occurred to me I'd ever lived to be 55. Because fighter pilots don't live. They just sort of fade away. So I talked to my wife. She said, well, what are you going to do when you're 55? I said, well, I guess I'm going to be an assistant director. I met the council on Saturday, handed me a little slip of paper, which said, report to MGM at 6 a.m. Monday morning. I had not the slightest idea what the hell I was going to do or supposed to do. But my dad did say, if you're an assistant director and you go to work for somebody, carry a piece of paper and run. Now, most assistant directors are usually kids. I was 35 years old. I was a lieutenant colonel. I had 400 airmen and 40 airplanes. And I'm carrying this piece of paper and I'm running to get this asshole actor a cup of coffee. And I just run all the faster. That was my first day in the business. Key witness. I placed my life at the mercy of cold-eyed young hoodlums because I was the key witness. Jeffrey Hunter, Pat Crowley, and uh, Dennis Hopper. He was a kid, just a baby. I want you to go quick and easy to the DA, like, and I want you to rip up that paper, Daddy O. And I want you to tell him that you ain't seen what you think you've seen. So what was the job as a, the assistant director back then? Run to get the asshole actors a cup of coffee and do all the paperwork. You had to do all, you had to do the call sheets, you had to do the production report, you had to do all the adjustments for, for the extras. You get there for the first makeup and you're there doing the last adjustments at night. One of the first pieces of advice that I gave new second assistant directors, the number one piece of advice, learn to hate all actors. Because every, every young actor, when they go out and they get too much dope, too much booze, stay out too late, will always come up with the excuse that I didn't get my call from the second assistant director or he didn't give me the script change. And it's so easy to change the second assistant director that you can't change the star of a show. It was a great life. When I got in the movie industry, which is 1959, October, I was still flying. Militarily, I can jump right in there, but when you're working in the land of make-believe, <laughs> it doesn't really compute to a military mind. Did, did you find, in general, most actors were nice to work with? You know, it turns out that a lot of it has to do with age. 
Loved Ernie Borgnine. I did Emperor of the North with him. And I had my wife up there with me, and uh, it was very hot. And Ernie insisted that she go in, into his dressing room where it was cool while we were shooting. And, you know, we did a lot of switching of trains. Ernie would drive one of the engines while the engineer drove the other one. He loved it. He was great. The older actors were great. Young kids are usually caught up in their money and their status. This is the continuing story of Peyton Place. On Peyton Place, I had Mia Farrow and, and Brown and Neil. Up in. I've got to go to school. Service with a smile, drive you straight to the door. And both of them turned out to be great, great actors. But during their young age, they were pains in the ass. Mia Farrow was in the middle of her love affair with Frank Sinatra, and I handled the phones. The phone would ring, and it'd say, Charlie Brown calling Mia Farrow. And I'd say, Mia Farrow's on the set and can't talk. Hang up. And the phone would ring. Charlie Brown has to talk to Mia Farrow. I said, Mia Farrow's acting. Hang up. Because if, if I allowed him to talk to her, she would go to her dressing room and not come out for two hours. Well, in Peyton Place, we had to average 14 pages a day. We couldn't afford to lose her for, for two hours. I was with Mia Farrow the day that she changed hair from long to short. And I, I feel that I have something to do with it. Mia used to have to come in at 5 o'clock in the morning, and she would iron her hair, which was very long, blonde, blurred down to the middle of her fanny. And I came in this morning after she had ironed it, and she was standing in front of the mirror, and she had her hair up. She said, Larry, how do you think I would look in short hair? And I looked at her, I looked at her face, I said, I think you look pretty damn cute. And that was it. We were doing a scene in a hospital. She'd had a, some kind of an accident. Well, we had shot the principal part of the scene, and uh, then we had to do some relighting. And Mia went into the makeup department. When I went in to get her, she had short hair. She had cut her hair. I said, Mia, you know it's not going to match. <laughs> she, had, she had a grin on her face. She said, I know, but I just want to see what they're going to do. I got on the phone. I called Paul Moda. She was the producer. I said, you better come down here. We, I think you've got a problem with the next scene that we're doing. So he came down, and he looked at Mia. He said, well, what have you shot? I said, well, we've done the, we've done the scene. We're now getting ready to do close-ups. He sat down, he scribbled a few lines. What he had written was for Dr. Rossi, and his, his one sentence was, Do you like it? It takes getting used to. I took a look at my little girl hair, and I decided I didn't want it anymore. Took care of the whole set, whole thing, just like that. <laughs> we, and from that on, though, it would, her hair was trimmed up nice and women's girls' hair became very short after that. So I have to say, I had something to do with girls having short hair. <laughs> On Friday, uh, Frank Dottridge would just disappear. Dean Martin would bring us booze and Peter offered to sit a drink with us. Sammy Davis was, was great. He would take the crew and invite them down and entertain them, pay for the bill for the whole crew. Really made us feel like we were something. One of the main pictures that I did was Breakfast at Tiffany. We really should have won the Academy. Hadn't been for the fact that we were up against Ben-Hur we would have. 
But one of my jobs was to keep Henry Mancini and uh, Johnny Mercer happy with coffee and sandwiches and donuts while they were dinkling around with this little tune, I think. What is it called? Uh, Moon River. Uh, Do See the world, there's such a lot of world to see. I went home and I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, I've heard the next great hit. Little did I realize I was really listening to a classic. And when we were all done shooting and Andrea had done her song, we had three copies. And Henry Mancini gave me one. And I said, hell, Henry, I don't have anything that can play 16 RPM. I gave it back to him. Can you imagine having one of three original copies of Moon River just given to you? What it would be worth today? Wow. Well, I was new to the industry, and I didn't keep things in those days. <laughs> I made probably 20 flights across the North Atlantic solo. And then in 1961, we had a contract for eight RF-84F Republic Thunder Flash. I'd made one trip across, and the second trip on takeoff at night there, I had a sick engine. I knew it was sick. All I wanted to do was get it to Tinker Field and just leave it and go back and get another airplane. And I just got it off the runway, and the wheels had just locked. And I'm just, I just relaxed and started picking up best climb speed, and the engine blows up. If you've ever been on a fast elevator that you planned on going up and it went down instead, that's what it felt like. It felt like the whole bottom just fell right out. The normal procedure when you're when you're making a landing like that in a rough landing, you drop the gear so that the gear will take the first impact. Well, this airplane had a long, spindly nose gear, but short, stubby main gear. And I knew the first thing would happen is that nose gear would collapse. And at the speed I was going, which was about 180 miles an hour, I know I know that I know that the nose would dig in, and it probably just flipped me over. And I knew that would kill me for sure. And I thought, well, Republic airplanes are ruggedly built. They've been known to keep the cockpit together if you just don't cartwheel. At 180, I just relaxed back pressure, let her fly into the ground. And the last thing I did, I just reached up and turned up the fuel. I made an absolutely beautiful landing. At night, I kept the wing tanks on. They were empty, the external stores. And they took the first jolt of landing on the belly. And I remember the tail dragging. And then my next thought was, oh, shit. After 19 years of flying, what a way to get it. Because I knew I was dead. There was no way I could live out of this. The fire hit its way through the heat and vent system into the cockpit, set the liquid oxygen on fire, which is on the right. And I must have breathed fire because we had the visor and the helmet on the outside in those days. I always kept it fastened and never kept it loose. But yet they found the helmet with the oxygen at my feet. So I must have breathed fire and just yanked that thing off and not knowing about it. The next thing I heard was a voice saying, don't move, you've been burned in the mouth and the throat, and we're gonna put a tracheotomy so you can breathe later. And I heard myself say, you mean I'm alive? And they said, hell yes, you're alive. That I don't remember anything later. 
what had happened was that the fire was in the cockpit. The boy in the asbestos suit put his hands right through the melting plexiglass, peeled it back, reached in into the fire to find the seat ejection seat safety pins where however they were and put them in so that he could cut me out without that seat exploding. So that had to take quite a time. And I've always marveled how he did that. Anyway, what you see is the results of seven years of work. That's the only part of my face that's left. I would like to make a joke with the waitresses, have them kiss me on the cheek. And then when they do it, they say, well, you just kissed my belly. <laughs> That's my new line. <laughs> and it works. It really works. <laughs> my granddaughters always say, Grandpa, give me the smooth side. Because this got whiskers in it. <laughs> this doesn't. New nose, new eyelids, new mouth, right to right here. I thought I was going to lose this hand. Started learning to write left-handed. About 150 operations total, seven years. But you know, life is beautiful. <laughs> the day Kennedy was shot was the first time I worked on a set again. And uh, it was very strange because we, it, was a, it was a one day shoot and we had to finish. And I had to pull the crew together. Now I was very rough, I had no nose. My burns were very fresh, but the guild was trying to put me back on my feet. And probably the only industry in the, that would accept me the way I was was the movie industry because it's a land of make-believe. When I was doing Peyton Place, we were, stage nine was right across the street from the makeup department. And I'd be in there to get an actor or an actress or something or do something. And I'd come out and they were, especially the young actresses would look at me, my gosh, what a gorgeous makeup. What, are you, what part are you playing? And then they would find out that it was really me. They were always very apologetic. Before I knew it, I was just working just like I always did. Once I got past my own self-consciousness, I developed the philosophy, and that is, I'm behind my face. I don't see it. And unless I'm looking in the mirror, I don't, I just, I'm looking like I always did. So if I act natural, then pretty soon they've got to act natural. And that's what happens. It all adds up to great experience. I've had a marvelous life. Other than the fact my wife died so young, she was 50 when she died, died 1976. Other than that fact, I've got 11 grandkids, eight great grandkids, and four beautiful children of my own. I've had a, a very beautiful life the way I look at it. And as I said at the beginning, my life has been a, under a constant white 